Thank you all for joining. We are just uh, 10 days away from Pesach, but we're still sticking to the portion of the Shabbos reading and also a little bit about preparation for Pesach because this Shabbat is called Shabbat HaGadol, the great Shabbos. We'll explain why it's called by that name. So we have a, often the portions read last week and this week are read together, Tazri and Matsura. But this time, because we've had two months of Adar, most of the double headers have been separated. So last week we had Tazria, and this week we have Matsura. The theme pretty much stays the same, that there is a spiritual leprosy that affected somebody. We call it leprosy just because that seems to be the, 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 the best translation, but it's actually a mistranslation because it was not a medical condition that came from a physical ailment. It was a spiritual disease that manifested itself in the body. And therefore, as we'll soon see, it was diagnosed and taken to the Kohen to determine which way to go. Now in the purification, so a lot of this was discussed last week. Now it speaks about taking it to the Kohen and then um, the, the purification process. What happens with the purification process is that you have to take two birds. We'll come back to the fact that why it was two birds a cedar plank, a branch from a cedar tree, a scarlet thread, and water from a live, live stream. The individual shave twice and bring three animals and oil offering to the temple. Very technical exactly how they reach the point of purification. Now, for financial reasons, two birds could be substituted for the two animals because some people couldn't afford, and that certainly wasn't going to limit their ability to become purified. The Kohen evaluates pigmentation on stones and quarantines the home for up to three weeks. Because we mentioned last week, this disease could take hold of the person and it could be a lesion on the skin, in which case it's the physical person that was evaluated. It could take place on the clothing that a person wore and the clothing would be put aside. It could even take hold of one's home and in the reverse order would start from the furthest removed from the house. If the person still didn't get it worked out and it take hold of his clothing, and then it came closer even to take hold of his own skin. And there was a process that if the home itself had these lesions, they would eventually chop out parts of the wall, similar to we do in, when we have damp in the wall, to save the rest of the building, you destroy that part which has been and where it manifests in, in the physical home. And then the home is either declared pure or it's affected, stones are removed and the house is demolished. The purification process of, for such a home, how, does, how do you purify? And various forms of ritual impurity and the method of purification, including immersing in a mikvah, because anything that came into contact would then have to be purified, would have to be taken to the mikvah. So really, there's very little room, you would think, to get life messages from a very technical passage in the Torah that talks about what details to bring the birds and, and how to, to, to administer it, and what technical things to put into the recipe. Very technical, you'd think there isn't much room to get any messages, but the Torah means instruction book, it doesn't mean a law book, Hora'ah means to instruct, and Torah means the instruction manual. It gives us lessons on how to live our lives. Let's see some of them. First thing I want to actually draw attention to is that we said the whole of last week we're talking about this disease, spiritual disease, which is because of Lashon Hara, person speaking negative talk, and the method by which Hashem reminded this person to do Teshuvah was to bring lesions on his home, and if that didn't work on his clothing, and eventually on himself. The verses go in a bit of a reverse order. Last week we spoke about the person, we spoke about clothing. This week we talk more about the physical home, the bricks and mortar. What's interesting is that the word tzara'at is the term used for the ailment, for the medical, for the physics, for the condition, of having this spiritual uh, leprosy. But the word metzora is the label we give to the person who has tsaras. It's called a metzora, the leper. 
would be the translation, even though it's not regular leprosy. This word Mitzorah does not appear once in the entire last week. It speaks about Tzara'as, leprosy. It talks about the place that has been infected by leprosy. It never calls and labels the person a Mitzorah, not until the first week, first verse of this week. And in fact, it is beyond Tahara so. In the day that the person becomes purified, we say Zot Tarat HaMitzara. This is the teaching relating to the Mitzara, the leper. Now we're labeling the person for the first time. But when? The Yom Tahara so, on the day that he became healed. So people, we're going to talk a little bit about labeling. People love to label. You know, what kind of Jew are you? You know, which, shul, which team are you with? We, lo we love to have labels because then it kind of puts people in their pigeonholes, categorized, then I know exactly where you belong. Labels could be very dangerous because it's not good to label people. People are much deeper, much broader, much bigger than labels. Particularly when it comes to labeling with a negative tinge, you've got to know the difference between a comment that you are lazy, a lazy person, or you've got to deal with laziness. You could, teachers could write on a report, your child um, is, needs to work harder. That could be a legitimate uh, comment. But imagine if a teacher would write on the report, your child is lazy, is lazy. That's a label. That's saying I've now categorized your child. It doesn't really help us to find a way out, to find a way how to improve, to change things. It becomes a label, you are a this, and then the child thinks, okay, I'm, 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 a, I'm a lazy person, so I'll, I will live down to that category and that label. I will now live according to the way you've defined me. So labels are very, very dangerous. Deal with the issues, deal with what you want to improve, but never label the child. Don't label your spouse or your uh, child or your parent. Don't call a name. A name is a very dangerous thing, because that person will then start thinking, ah, I am not smart. I've been labeled as, 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 uh, as, as stupid, God forbid. Then, then the person will act that way. That's how they'll live. They'll condition themselves. There are many tests that have been done with teachers. Often it's a discussion when you hand over class to a new teacher, do you tell the next teacher all your impressions about the student? Student A, is like a 50 percenter, student B is a 70 percenter. Ah, oh, this kid's very smart. Do you tell the next teacher or not? And they did very interesting objective studies and they found that if they don't, the teacher who takes over could sometimes have very different results from the previous teacher. Because the previous teacher has in their mind labeled the children in certain categories and the new teacher is coming in fresh. More than that, they did a study that what happens if the old teacher tells the new teacher, these kids are brilliant. They're all 80 percenters. These are distinction kids, even if the kids been 50 or 60 percent. And the new teacher comes in thinking, ah, oh, these kids are, I better work hard because these kids are distinction quality. And sometimes the kids are suddenly catapulted into a whole new realm just because we label them positively, but to label negatively, we should never do. And that's why it's interesting, although we had a whole portion last week that spoke about this disease, we never called a person a metzora, you are a leper, never. We never used the word until the first verse of this week. It says, Zot Torah Ha Metzora, this is the teaching of the leper, the Yom Torah on the day that he became pure on the day that he's no longer a leper. Now you're talking in retrospect. Now you're talking historically. You can tell somebody, you know, yesterday you, 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 you weren't concentrating or you, you, were, you were not a good student. The label, if it's in retrospect, if it's talking about history, is no longer applicable to the moment now. It's resolved, it's fixed, it's over. So now you can talk about what was, because now you can contrast to what was the problem that there's no longer a problem. Never use a label in the present. I know, I've discussed, I think I mentioned recently, one of my children had um, in one of their subjects, 
all the way through high school, grade seven, eight, nine, a little bit in 10 was a senior teacher. So now it's a takeover towards matric. And the teacher that was there before always gave 60%, 60%. And my child believed in that subject, 60%. And fine, we were happy that this is what we knew that our kid was working, 60%. Moved into the senior part of the high school, and that teacher said for the first time, there's something special in the way that you write. You really have an exceptional talent in writing. And she built up confidence. And after a year, she said, you know what, you, you're an A student. You could get an A in English. And she got an A in English. And she was 60%, grade seven, eight, nine. So the way we label often then defines how we relate to and how we tell the child to relate to the label. Be careful not to do labels. And only by Yom Tahara son, the day that it's over, it's fixed and it's resolved. You can talk about the condition that this person was yesterday, only to contrast to the fact that today it's over. We fixed it, it's finished. And that same theme, comes through in, a, in another way when we talk about labels too. Who do you bring the Matsura to for diagnosis? Normally, if there's a real physical ailment, ailment, only to a doctor. The doctor is trained how to deal with illness, and you don't take your illness to a rabbi. Never, because the rabbi is not trained in how to diagnose illness. You take it to a doctor. There was a whole discussion um, at the time of the Entebbe miracle, when the Israeli um, combat, combat unit went in and they rescued from across the world, I don't know if you remember that Saturday night, I think it was uh, 1975 or six, um, and, and uh, the, on the other side of it, they went to Entebbe, there's, there's movies, books written about the subject. So, at the time, the Rebbe commented that this was a tremendous miracle. And one of the protagonists, one of the people that constantly found fault in the Rebbe's approach to things, said, how could it be a miracle if it came about through people who do not keep mitzvahs? The soldiers do not keep mitzvahs necessarily. So how could a miracle come about through an instrument that isn't the holiness of being a Shabbos Shabbos and keeping kashras and keeping all the mitzvahs of the Torah. And the Rebbe responded and he said, if you have, God forbid, somebody has an illness and you have two doctors to choose between, I'm not saying between a rabbi and a doctor, let's say two doctors. And the one is a doctor who keeps 613 commandments and the other doctor is an atheist. Which doctor do you go to? Of Peter, according to the Torah, which doctor should you go to? You go to the expert, that's it. This is a process of diagnosis. You take it to the expert. You don't take it to the person who's... So if God works through doctors, whether they're religious or not, they're the instruments of bringing healing, then Hashem brings miracles through these Kedoshe Israel, these holy ones who put their life on the line for the sake of the Jewish people and acknowledge it as a miracle. It is an instrument of Hashem. I'm saying this only because Normally you go to the expert and the expert is a doctor. In this case, the Torah tells you, take it to the Kohen, because we've explained that it is a spiritual illness that needed to have a diagnosis of a spiritual condition. But the question is, why to, why to a Kohen? Why not to a Levi? Why not to any Jew? Why not to the rabbi who happens to be a Yisrael? But why to a Kohen? So take a look at the context of the diagnosis, the label that is being attributed. We're either gonna label this person impure, or we're gonna label this person pure. We're gonna label them to be a Mitzvah, we're gonna label them to be not a Mitzvah, that, 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 that the disease has been healed. Who gives that label? A Kohen, because a Kohen's function as a condemner and ostracizer to condemn the person to have to go outside of the camp and to ostracize them runs contrary to his most basic nature and role. What does a coin normally do outside of determining whether this person has to be banished? The coin is commanded by Hashem to bless the Jewish people. 
and to bless them with love. And our sages describe a disciple of Aaron as one who loves peace, pursues peace. Oyev es ha-toyro makarvel he loves every single creature. Oyev es ha-toyro makarvel ha-toyro, he loves every creature and brings them close to the A kayan's whole function normally is to love, to bless, to lift up, to care. But this is precisely the reason that the Torah trusts to the Kohen and only to the Kohen the task of condemning the Mitzorah. Who gives the label when it's necessary to send the person outside of the camp? You are no longer pure. You are impure. Who can give that label? Only somebody whose whole life is dedicated to embracing, loving, caring, blessing. Kohen. And we're not all Kohanim. What message does that have for all of us? What it's telling us is that if ever you're going to make a diagnosis or, as happens often in life, reprimand somebody, complain about the way they're behaving, certainly a teacher, a principal at school, you tell a child you've not behaved well, you have a responsibility to do that. But who is going to be successful in reprimanding a child? In telling a child that you can have a, a, a you, you've been sent into into uh, um, uh, to, to stay after school in detention, who's going to be successful in actually modifying behavior and affecting the child? It's going to be the teacher who has used every possibility to express love, care, care. I care about you. You are so much part of my, my feeling and my caring, and I've communicated on every single day of my life. I've always told teachers, you need four or five times the proportion of love to be able to have the glue, the acceptability in that student to reprimand them. Because otherwise they, they'll hate you. They think you, you hate them. They think that you're only trying to show your power and your authority, and they will resent a punishment. When does it have a chance of having a success when you are strict and reprimanding a child? If the child knows that on every other circumstance outside of that which happened, you have been loving, caring, embracing, blessing. We need to establish relationships in order to be strict in order that one's voice as a parent in disciplining a child is going to have positive effect, you have to invest your time and your love. If you wanna be a friend who's gonna point out the failure of a friend and do so in a way that is gonna be productive, you have to be a friend that had this person knows you love them and you care for them and you've got their back. And in that context, you've come to identify the failure. Because then identifying the failure isn't labeling negatively, it's identifying the process of healing. The reason why I'm pointing out your fault is not to make you feel bad, is not to diminish you, demean you. I'm pointing out the failure in order that you could grow. But how do I know that? I can only know that if it comes from somebody who has invested so much in me that I know they mean my good. And we learn this from the fact that Hashem says, who do you take the tzarat, this ailment, to for evaluation? You take it to a koyen. Why a koyen? Because a koyen's whole role is love, upliftment, caring, investing, blessing. That's what he does every single day, all day. And you go to him and he says, in this situation, you need to leave the camp because you are stricken by this spiritual ailment. The person looks at the coin and says, I know you're not telling it to me because you want to hurt me or to demean me. You're telling it to me because you want to heal me. That is what my experience has been with you every moment until now. It's only come from love. That's the challenge, to be able to express any Strictness or any reprimand, any gvura, discipline, can, has to be in the context of great love. 
Yemin Mekarebes, the right hand embraces and brings close, and the, and the right hand and the left hand is doiche, has to sometimes be the force of discipline. But only use the left hand in discipline if you have used the right hand five times more, maybe more. You can't go over to somebody and tell them their failings and expect them to say thank you if you haven't invested love and time and energy in that person. You have to be the real friend. In chapter 32 of Tanya, it says that if you are going to point out somebody's failings, you have to be a person who has shown love, who has invested with love, who cares. You are a dear, dear friend. And then when you point out a failing, a weakness, the person doesn't react by saying, why are you saying that to me? It hurts and become defensive and become angry because you pointed out a failing, they recognize you mean they're good. And all of that's learned from the fact that the Torah says, take the evaluation to a koya. That's the person who, who determines that you have to be banished from the camp. The person who is only associated with love. Now, one of the two things that you have to take, one of the things that you have to take for the process of healing is, is you take two birds. Why do birds have anything to do with this? So Rashi, the Talmud says, because the plague of Tzarat came from the punishment, for the punishment of evil talk, which is an act of chattering. Therefore, birds are needed for this purification because these chatter continuously with a twittering sound. The birds are always in fact, what do we call now the social media platform in which people talk the most nonsense, the most absolute worthless information? It's Twitter. On Twitter, you write that today I had a sandwich and this is what was in my sandwich. And then I walked there and I saw that, came here. All the absolute um, useless piece of information about one's life you put on Twitter. And people spend a lot of time doing this. And the danger is that when you enter Twitter, talk, 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 and that becomes your pastime. Eventually, you get over the pale and over the edge, and you start talking things that are inappropriate, negative, and eventually harmful, eventually lost and hurt. And as we said last week, when that happens, three people get hurt. The person about whom one is talking, because one paints them in a negative way, and that ruins their life. The person who's listening because they're listening to Lashon Hara and the person is talking because you're the one initiating. So don't um, be a person who twitters like a bird, rather sing, sing like a bird, don't twitter like a bird. Now, other items that you take in the process, we said it's so te technical, but everything has a message. So why do you take cedar wood and the hyssop? These are two extreme opposite forms of foliage of, of growth from the ground. The cedar tree is associated with strength, power, tall, very dense wood. The cedars of Lebanon are described as the great trees, tall, proud, big trees, firm, strong. The hyssop is a bush. It's a little bit of foliage. It's, it's leaves on a, on, on a bit of a stem. No backbone, no strength very, very flimsy, very, very light. So the Midrash says, why do you take both of these things? Because a person has to have two elements to master life. You have to be strong like a cedar and you have to be humble like a hyssop, which is like grass that blows in the wind, that is able to go with the pressure as the wind comes and gives, gives this way, gives that way. Because humility, we could often think comes from a disregard of self. We could think, who is the most humble person? The person who thinks that they're a total nitwit. If they believe that they're nothing, then they stand a chance of being humble. That's not what we mean by humble. Who is the most humble person in the entire world ever, in the history of the world? Moses was the most humble person of every person in the entire world. Who? Moses. Did Moses know that he was the only person who spoke directly to God? The answer is yes. Moses knew that he was the only person who spoke directly to Hashem. He knew that he stood apart. He was the only one on Mount Sinai. He knew that he had special 
conditions and connections with Hashem that nobody else had. Moses wasn't ignorant of who he was. And yet he was the most humble person in the entire world. Humility doesn't come from saying I'm a nothing. Humility is when you are aware of your strengths, but then you recognize Hashem gave me these only for a purpose. I have a responsibility. Maybe if somebody else had these special qualities, they would have achieved much more than I achieved. That's what Moshe Rabbein always said to himself. Imagine if Hashem went to Aaron or to, or to somebody else at the burning bush and asked them, they would have been a much better leader than me. So it wasn't that he thought he was nothing. He knew his strengths, but he always realized that he had to be grateful and acknowledge and recognize that Hashem had invested in him and therefore he had to live up to his abilities and talents. And so you need to have both the cedar and the hyssop. The ability to give in the wind, to be humble, not to stand up and say, I'm important and I'm not going to give in. And at the same time, to be proud and strong. And you have to know when to use which one. When you're a Jew walking in the public domain and you look around and you see somebody is seeing you as a Jew and you suddenly hide, hide your yarmulke, or you're scared to put on to fill in in the airplane because people are watching, then remember you have to stand like a cedar tree. Strong, powerful. I'm not, I don't give an inch. You want, you want me to give up who I am? I'm not going to give up who I am. But when a person says, please, could you stand aside? Give me space. Give me a place. Do you mind if I sit down? Then don't stand proud like a cedar. That's the time to say, please come before me. I give my space for you. I give my place for you. So there's a very delicate balance. And it's not about, God forbid, being locked into pride, which could be the ruin of a person. But it's also not a person walking around and saying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. As we'll soon see from a bunim of Pshisha, we're going to say that. So first, the Hasidic masses say, if the point is that one should be humble, why does he bring a cedar at the hyssop? But the true meaning of humility is not to be broken and bowed, but to be humble even as one stands straight and tall. It's a delicate balance. Know your strengths, but always be humble because who gave them to you? Hashem. How are you using them? Are you utilizing them to the utmost? Don't say, I'm a nothing and I'm a nobody. Another famous joke of the guy who walks into shul before Yom Kippur, the, the shaman, and he walks in and he says, Oh, hey, I'm in front of the ark. Oh, hey, I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. I'm a garnish. I'm, I'm like, like dust of the earth. First, the rabbi comes in, he says it. Then the chazan comes in, he says it. Then the shamash, the simple shamash comes in, he hears them saying it. So he also says, I'm nothing. And the chazan tells the rabbi, he says, Oh, look who thinks he's a nothing. <laughs> the, the shamash also thinks he's a nothing. You, know, you could be very arrogant in your pride. You have to know exactly what pride means and what arrogance means and what humility means. As your Buni Shishka says so beautifully, a person should have two pockets in his coat. One should contain the Talmudic saying, as it says in, in Sanhedrin, a person is commanded to maintain this whole world was created for me. This whole world was created for me. That's one, one pocket has that piece of paper. In the second pocket, he should keep the verse from Genesis, which Abraham Avinu said, I'm dust and ashes and nothing. Now you have two pieces of paper in your pocket, one pocket, one other pocket. Now comes the challenge. How do I know which piece to take out for which circumstance? So when you're standing in line and somebody needs a favor or somebody says, please, can I? And, and, and you say, the world's made for me. I don't care about everybody. I push in front. I, I push people aside. The world's made for me. God forbid. And that's the time that you got to say, I should be humble like, like Dustin. But when it comes to having to take a stand in your Yiddishkeit, in your Judaism, and to be strong, you got to say, Hashem put me here because this world has a possibility of being connected to Hashem. And my job is to connect this world to Hashem. This whole world was put here for me. Not to serve me. Not to make me self-indulge. It was put here for me to help perfect it and bring it close to Hashem. It's a challenge. 
to know which piece of paper to look at in which set of circumstances. Sometimes people think that the whole world is made for them and therefore they're entitled to everything and they stand on people, push people aside. That's not what we're talking about. We have to know, said Reb Winnie Rapshisko, which moment calls on which piece of paper. When one's affecting the world positively and when he's saying a bracha before you eat, then you got to say, this whole world was created for me. I'm coming into an arena to bring it closer to Hashem. What's my next move to make this world achieve perfection? Look what God entrusted into my head. I have responsibility. If it's responsibility, then you can see yourself as the agent of change. If it's about self-indulgence, then use the other verse. I'm dust and ashes. Don't get carried away with yourself at all. I'm not sure if we mentioned this last week or not. Um, if I did, then this is a bit of a repeat. Maybe I didn't. We said that when you come to the land of Klan, I will put this disease in your home, in the walls of your home. And then there will be times that you have to break open the wall of your home because it has this disease. And then you'll have to cement and close. After you've gone through the purification process, you'll reconstruct your home. And the Midrash, quoted by Rashi, I'll say it outside, says that actually they had a moment of great positive influence from Hashem, blessing. Because what happened was before the Jews came to the land of Khan, the Ammonites who lived there before, the people of Ammon didn't know where to put their wealth and they were scared they were going to lose their wealth. They took their jewelry and their gold and their silver and their diamonds. They weren't banks and safety deposit boxes and they cemented it into the walls of their home and painted it over so nobody would know it's there. They knew. And if ever they would need the wealth, they'd go and take it. So the Jews were living in these homes for a long time. And they didn't know that in the wall of their home was this tremendous wealth. Now they sinned. They spoke Lashon Hara. Now they sent to resolve the problem of their house being affected. They chop open the wall and voila, they find in the wall all this tremendous wealth. So as we're going to see inside of here, it's good news for them that these plagues would come about. Why? Because the Amorites, not Ammonites, Amorites, residents of Khan. They concealed treasures of gold in the walls of their houses during the 40 years that the Israelites were in the wilderness in order that they would not possess them when they conquered the land. And in the consequence of the plague, they pulled down the house or the wall and they discovered the wealth. Now, what is that Midrash meaning? It can be meaning that we want a person to be wealthy. It's very important to be wealthy. That can't be the instruction that the most important thing is to be wealthy. It's saying something very, very profound. I don't think the Torah doesn't mind and, and encourages a person to, 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 to look and to acquire the wealth because we can give tzedakah. It's a very good thing. But here we're talking about a miracle that lands up opening the wall of your home to discover. It's on a much deeper level. Something went wrong in your life. You spoke Lashon Ara. You were even responsible. You caused it. You have to resolve it. You have to fix it. You have to be banished. Your house has to be broken down. But you have to look for, amidst a collapse of the strength of your life and the strength of the past, you have to look for the wealth, the positive that can come out of the negative, because there's opportunity. The opportunity is to find not just the healing, so that your house goes back to the exact same way as it was. You broke your house, you plastered the house, and now you live in exactly the same house as you lived before. You have to live in a new house, a completely different house. You have to live with newfound strengths, newfound values, growth, development. The, the problems that go we go through in life are not only the challenge to be able to survive and endure and come through and, and be a survivor. No, if Hashem put us through a challenge, it's not only, obviously that in itself is a greatness that we survived the challenge. We didn't succumb, we weren't overwhelmed. It's great that we survive, but what's the inner purpose? The inner purpose of a difficulty, even one that we brought in our life because we did the wrong thing. 
the punishment is not retribution. The punishment is an invitation by Hashem to say, find the wealth, find the growth, find what you have treasures deep inside of you that you've never realized until now. This is the moment to uncover them. You're going to emerge from this taller and stronger than you ever were. If you only go about the process of rehabilitating yourself, as the Torah tells you, reconstructing yourself, come out wealthy. So there's physical wealth, but there's also spiritual, emotional, human wealth that we are now able to have a reservoir of newfound strength that we didn't know we had. That's why Hashem calls us the walls to have to be crumbled. It's in order to discover the wealth. That's such like an amazing thing, because it's not only when things happen to us and we don't know why they happen to us, yeah, this is a guy who knows why it happened. He spoke Lashon Hara. So he's being punished. So the house has to be broken down. But look how Hashem says, the Midrash says, even the problem that you initiated because you failed. So Shuba, turning your life around, gives you the opportunity of standing taller than you ever stood before. Find the wealth. The wealth is in the problem that you are now opening up. There's wealth that you can find. Isn't that beautiful? Methods of, of growing. Very quick thought that the person who is then declared Tamei has to inform people around him that he is Tamei. You know, we had it now, so many parallels to COVID that you have to be sent outside and quarantine and not come into contact with anyone. That was basically what was happening over here. The person had COVID, you had to tell people. Because if you didn't tell people, somebody else was going to be infected by the disease, right? So informing people was even criminal. To, to go into a public domain and not inform people that you have it would be a criminal act. So likewise then, you had to inform people and say, I am Tamei, so that nobody else would catch the impurity from you. And the way that it's worded in the verse is Tamei, Tamei, Yikra. He shall call out, Yikra means to call out, call out, Tamei, Tamei, I'm impure, I'm impure. That's the simple meaning of the verse. Comes a more Hasidic, deeper, additional level of understanding of the verse and puts a comma between the two Tameis. Tamei, comma, Tamei, Yikra. What that means then is, Tamei, the person who is impure, Tamei, Yikra, calls everything around him impure. That's not the simple meaning of the verse. The simple meaning is, Tamei, Tamei, I'm, I'm impure, I'm impure. On a deeper level, because the Torah has so many levels. Tamei, the person who has their own problem, Tamei Yikra looks at the whole world with a negative glance of their own failures. In modern psychology, we call it projection. When we are in a bad mood, we see people in a bad mood. When we are have a failing and a flaw, we look around and that's what we see in everybody else. Our own failing, we see in them. And, and, and often, we don't see ourselves, we don't see our failing, we only see it in everybody else. But projection means that when we are caught up in a problem, we often project that problem on everyone else around us. Be careful. And the, if you see, the Baal Shem Tov said, if you see a failing in somebody else, that in itself is an opportunity to say, well, maybe there's something in where, where can I self-reflect when I've seen a failure in somebody else? Tamei, the person who is Tamei, Tamei Yikra calls everybody else Tamei. It's not the simple meaning. So just one final slide in these last five minutes about Shabbat HaGadol. What happened this Shabbat that it's called the Great Shabbos? Now, the first Pesach that took place, Pesach was on a Thursday, and the 10th of Nisan, happened to fall out on Shabbos. What happened that day? Well, on the first day of the month, we were told to begin counting time, the first day of the now the new first month of the year, the month of Nisan, the month of Pesach. And then they were to count 10 days. And on the 10th day, they were to take a sheep and they were to bring it into their homes and tie it to their bedposts where it would remain for the next four days, at the end of which they would bring a Korban Pesach. Now, 
This was a tremendous act of self-sacrifice. Why? Because the, the deity of Egypt at that time was the, was the lamb, was the sheep. In fact, and it's a whole subject that we can go into in much greater depth, the month of Nisan in the signs of the zodiac, which are never ever by Jewish intention meant to predetermine or to define us, God forbid, because we're born under this sign or that sign that we don't believe in. But we certainly believe there's influence in the planetary systems that Hashem has put there, and certain months have certain values, and certain strengths and abilities. It just so happens that the month of Nisan is Aries, is the land. And the whole process of Pesach begins by counting time so that you'll count 10 days, and then you'll take a lamb into your homes. And then on the 14th day, you'll bring the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb offering. Why was it such a challenge? Because Egypt worshipped the lamb. And when the Jewish people were taking these lambs into their homes on the 10th of Nisan, a most unusual activity to take a lamb and tie it to the bedposts. So the Egyptians began asking, why are you taking our God into your homes and tying it to your bedposts? And the Jews said, because we're going to shecht your lamb. Your God is about to be pulverized and destroyed. It's the end of your God. And they were still in power, the Egyptians. The Jews were still um, and, uh, uh, under the influence and power of Egypt. It took tremendous self-sacrifice. They did it in broad daylight. They did it in the eye of the entire population of Egypt. And the Jews did it. And this brought about a debate and eventually an argument and eventually a civil war in Egypt because the, the, the firstborn said, now that they explained, they're going to take the lamb, they're going to shift it, they're going to take the blood, they're going to put it on the doorpost. And then when God kills the firstborn of Egypt, he's going to discern between the house that is not of a Jew, the Jew and the Jewish firstborn will survive. So the firstborn of Egypt obviously got a skrik. They got a big fright. This is what's their lot. They're going to now be destroyed by the um, God of Israel. It's coming to, so they turned to Pharaoh and said, let them go. Let them, we don't need this. We, we're about to have this terrible devastation. We, we, and and the, the elders and, and Pharaoh said, nothing doing. These are our slaves forever. They'll never be changed. We are in charge. We are in control. And eventually the young and the old started a civil war. And that's what we say, the Makkeh, Mitzrayim, Bifchorehem, Hashem destroyed Egypt with their own firstborn. Not only that he destroyed the firstborn, the firstborn began the battle against him. The beginning of the end of Egypt was when the civil battle and war and, 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 and strife took place within the fabric, within the society of Egypt. And all of this happened on the 10th of Nisan. So it was a very miraculous day of the Jewish people following the instruction of Hashem with such self-sacrifice. And that's why it was a day that would be called Gadol. But then the obvious question is, normally every other festival we keep by the day of the month. What day of the month did that happen? The 10th of Nisan. The 10th of Nisan this year, for example, is not Shabbos. The 10th of Nisan is, I think, Man uh, is Monday. And Pesach is on the 15th, is Friday night, Sunday. Right? So why do we call it Shabbat Agadol? Why do we keep the Shabbat as a remembrance of this miracle rather than the date? The date is the 10th of Nisan. If it falls on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbos. Why do we keep it as Shabbat? It's so a very briefly two explanations that the, the day of the 10th of Nisan is the yard site of Miriam. So the celebration of this miracle was marred in a sense by the loss of such a great woman who brought water, who brought so much sustenance to the Jewish people. So we moved the acknowledgement of this miracle to the Shabbat rather than keeping it on the date, which subsequently became a date associated with sadness, with loss. Secondly, Shabbat underscored the miracle because if a Jew took a lamb into his home on a Thursday, it looked strange. But for a Jew to take a lamb into his house on Shabbos, when we didn't get involved with our livestock on Shabbos. Shabbos was a day of rest. It only underscored, it drew it more attention. They were much more baffled 
and bewildered, how could the Jews be taking an animal into the house on Shabbos? We've spoken about the self-sacrifice, the civil war. And finally, the last point is that where did they put the sign of the blood of the Paschal offering? They put it on the doorposts of their home. Something maybe we can discuss more next week when we talk about Pesach, the centrality of the home as being the venue of the celebration of a birth of our nation. Nationhood in the Jewish religion is celebrated, commemorated, and developed in the individual home. That's where it happens. The home is the place that builds the nation. Very different to any other nation. Normally, nation what happens in the public domain, and here it happens in the home. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a wonderful week, and please, God, next Wednesday, we can share a few thoughts on Pesach. If you haven't yet sent your comments, I've sent out messages how to do so. If you can't come in, you can do it online. And please join us this coming Shabbos, a very special speaker from the Jewish Board of Deputies. Have a beautiful, beautiful Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. 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 Thank you.